success by house we strong hey whose side are you on make a decision by the end of this song hey whose side are you on choose life choose right or choose wrong hey whose side are you on you're moving with Satan you're moving along cuz what side am I on I chose Jesus by house we strong I'm going home sing it with me I'm going home Hey, I'm going home. Heaven's my home. Heaven's my home. Hey, I'm going home. If you believe it, I'm going home. Heaven, heaven, heaven's my home. So I'm, I'm going home. Amen, amen. Give God the glory this evening. Amen, amen, amen. Always appreciate, amen, that music and uh, lots of music, amen, uh, on Saturday night as well, 7 o'clock at the church. Amen. Psalm 77, verse 16, if you have your Bibles today. Psalm 77, verse 16. Amen. I want to minister on something tonight that uh, actually we, uh, this, this uh, thought, this sermon thought did come from the sermonizing that some of us pastors uh, do at conference. When it comes to conference, I know that many of what most people do will they'll be fellowshipping late and uh, barely make it into prayer or just kind of be there for the first sermon with Red Bull in their system, making sure they stay awake. But one of the things that many of us uh, pastors do is we recognize uh, we are, are together very short periods of time. And so we will wake up extra early, sometimes 6, 6.30, down for breakfast, and we'll be working on sermons together, dividing texts and, and putting messages together. And so this message actually comes from the breakfast uh, sermonizing session uh, with Pastor Greg Mitchell um, on Wednesday morning this week. And it was a great blessing to be able to write messages or uh, write sermons with him. Um, and I, I pray that it blesses you uh, this evening. In October 2022, there was a discovery in the UK where archaeologists found long-preserved human footprints that had been embedded in the floor of the coastline along the UK. Now, the reason why these uh, uh, footprints were discovered is because the coastline was changing, some of the sea was going back, and therefore, they were revealed. They, they found that one of the footprints actually had so much detail to it, when they're looking at the bone structure and all of those things, they actually think that it was a teenage boy, and, and there's so much detail, they think that he even had a bunion on his foot. That's how detailed the footprint is. Now, what's interesting is this footprint would have been thousands of years, hundreds, if not thousands of years old, and what's amazing is the footprint has always been there, but because it's been covered by the sea, no one knew that it was there. If you've been a Christian a length of time, you'll know the poem, Footprints in the Sand. Many of you have it in your bathroom or somewhere in your hallway or something in a picture frame. And the idea of that picture or that uh, poem is that God carries you through difficult times in your life. Times when you don't know direction, times when you don't know what you're doing, where you're going, how life is going to work out. There are people here tonight, you have no idea about what your future is going to be. You are aimless or you are confused by life and you're looking for God's help and direction. But what's amazing about this scripture is that it doesn't say God's footprints are in the sand. It says God's footprints are even in the sea. Now that's amazing because you can't see footprints in the sea, but they are still there to guide you. And I want to talk about footprints in the sea tonight from Psalm 77, verse 16 to 20. The Bible says, The waters saw you, O God. The waters saw you, and you were, they were afraid. Uh, the depths uh, also trembled. The clouds poured out water. The sky sent out a sound. The arrows also flashed about. The thun your voice or the voice of your thunder was in the whirlwind. The lightnings lit up the world. The earth trembled and shook. Your way was in the sea. 
your path in the great waters and your footprints were not known. You led the people like a flock by the hand of Aaron and Moses. Let me consider footprints in the sea today. Let me look first of all, church, about prayers in distress. In this scripture, this uh, psalm is actually a prayer. And the reality is, uh, actually, there are many different types of prayers. One of the most uh, common types of prayers is our daily prayers or our devotions. These are regular, consistent prayers. You should be praying every single day. I want to encourage you, if you're a Christian, pray every single morning. The first thing you do, you wake up, we have morning prayer for a reason to encourage people and enable people to put prayer into the beginning of their day. And I want to invite you to come along. But morning prayer is ultimately checking in. You're not really dependent upon anything. You don't necessarily need too much, but you are just going through the routine or the devotion. Psalms 5, 3, my voice you shall hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning I will direct it to you and I will look up. Daily prayer is the maintenance of your relationship with God. People who don't pray or read their Bible do not do well spiritually and therefore hurt themselves in the long run. It's kingdom business perhaps. It's transaction. It's guidance and direction for life. Sometimes in my morning prayers, I literally feel like, God, I'm sure we've been here just a few days ago. Uh, You know, it's me again. Hello. Uh, Sorry. Sorry for bothering your throne again. Matthew 6 verse 10, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But this psalm in our scripture today is a different type of prayer. It's actually a prayer in distress where psalms or where things are going wrong. Verse 2, in the day of my trouble, I sought the Lord. The NIV says, in the day of my distress. See, we don't know why this psalmist was in distress today. But what we do know is distress at different points in our life come to every single person. I hope you're not in distress today, but at some point in your life, you will be. It might be you have bad health or you get a a, a disease or uh, some kind of trouble. You would have heard in the news recently, Chris Hoy, the Olympian um, uh, uh, gold medalist. He's only 49 years old. He just got diagnosed with terminal cancer. He has between two and four years to live. You know what? That is a prayer. Suddenly, God, I'm in distress. Some of you today, it will be unsafe family and loved ones. You are uh, burdened or consumed. Uh, God, how? Save these people. Save and help them. It might be your marriage that's causing you distress. It might be money issues that you have problems with, unemployment and trouble. God, this is not how it should be. See, this psalm is describing the effect trouble can bring to our hearts. The Hebrew word for distress is to be anxious or to be vexed or to be put in pressure and hemmed in. Being in seasons of trouble, it's not about information. It's not like, you know what, my life is going down the drain and, oh, okay, never mind, let's have breakfast. What happens is, I don't know what to do. We're in emotion. We're, we're term- we've are we got turmoil. Our hearts are hurt. You can't sleep. There's pressure. There's pain. Verse 3 of the scripture, my spirit was overwhelmed. When trouble comes your way, there are times when you're in over your head and life is too difficult to deal with. You see, the lesson of our text is that trouble brings questions. Trouble in our scripture causes us to question God. When you have trouble, it's very natural that we start to question God's ability. Verse 7 and 9, will the Lord cast us off forever? Or will he be favorable no more? Has his mercy ceased? We begin to question God's love. In the New Testament, the disciples began to do this. They were in a storm and Jesus was asleep in the boat in the midst of the storm. Just imagine that. Jesus, we're fearing for our life. Help us. And suddenly turn around and Jesus is snoring, having 40 winks. I mean, that doesn't help you very much. 
But the Bible says in Mark 4.38, Teacher, don't you care that we're perishing? God, I have trouble and it doesn't look like you have any care for me. We begin to question God's power. In the, the verse 10 it says, Has God's right hand lost his grip? In other words, you know what, God, if you could, if you wanted to, you could help me. God, you could heal me. You could change this circumstance. Why are you not doing it? Is it maybe that actually you can't do it? You, this is too much even for you. Trouble also causes us to question ourselves. In 1 Kings 19, Elijah is in the cave and the Bible says he's in distress and he doubts himself. He basically says, you know what, there's no point in going on anymore. There are some people here tonight, you've experienced trouble and your conclusion, I'm not going to try and come to church anymore. I'm not going to try and read my Bible anymore. This doesn't work. This isn't helping me. I'm doubting anything that I'm able to do. Why would I bother doing it? The old Travis song goes, why did it rain on me? Uh, why does it always rain on me? Is it because I lied when I was 17? Look at what I've done in the past. That's the reason why I'm here today. Also, trouble makes us question leadership. See, the natural reaction in trouble is to point at somebody to blame. And headship is a very easy target. Exodus 17, verse 3, And the people thirsted there for water. And the people complained against Moses, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt? We're, we're, we're afraid and we're in distress. So we take it out on leadership. You know what? It's your fault that this happened. I trusted God because of your words. I listened to your counsel or your sermon. David's men, when the Bible says the enemy came and raided their camp and took the women and children. The Bible says in 1 Samuel 30 verse 6, David was greatly distressed for the people spoke of stoning him because their soul was grieved. Uh, uh, in other words, it's the leader's fault. Let's just blame him. See, in the text, ultimately, the psalmist's issue was not that he was in trouble, the issue is that he did not know where God was. Let me talk secondly about footprints in the sand. Because in our text it reveals actually God is with you in the storms of your life. Verse 16, the waters saw you, O oh God, the waters saw you and they were afraid. But actually this scripture speaks about a higher perspective that we have to consider to understand where God is. The psalmist is doubting God because of his trouble, but the bigger reality is God is above or God is beyond the trouble that you're in right now. It's very dangerous to base your theology, which is ultimately your view of God, based upon your circumstances. You know, many people will say things like, yeah, Jesus is alive. I want to thank God. God is so good because I just got a promotion at work. Praise Jesus. Amen. And everyone claps and it's all very good. Right? If you ask people about this, uh, on the streets, do you believe in God? And many people will say, I used to believe in God until, and you can fill in the blank, until he took my mom, until my life went bad, until this happened or that happened. Uh, I, I, and some people even here today, you know what? I used to believe in God. I used to trust God until I had trouble, until life went bad. We don't give testimonies, amen, do we? The, the, you know what? I just want to thank Jesus. This has been the hardest time of my life and I have no idea where God is. Praise God, praise God. That's so good. We don't do that because we recognize something about that is that we need to know where God is, but we can't see him many times. When, when Mary came to the tomb of Jesus, the Bible says she was distraught because of the tragedy of Jesus' death. She actually sees Jesus in the garden, but she mistakes him for the gardener in, the, in, 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 that, in that area. Her tragedy caused her not to see that Jesus was right next to her. 
The disciples were in another storm. Jesus is walking on the water. He's above the storm. He's with you in the midst of the storm. But human nature, we just see the storm. We just see the rain and the trouble and the pressure and the sickness and the the money issue. We just see all of those things. And we look and and what the disciples said, as Jesus was walking on the water, Matthew 14, 26, they saw him walking on the sea and were troubled. Is it a God? and they cried out in fear. Jesus was there, but trouble means that often we don't see God correctly. See, what we need to recognize, church, is God's presence is often hidden when you are going through troubles of life. The reality is that God is with you in the storm, but God can be difficult to see in the storm. Verse 19 of the NIV, your path, led through, uh, uh, your path led through the sea, your way through the mighty waters, though your footprints were not seen. I mean, footprints in the water are very difficult to make out. I don't, I don't see any footprints because the water just moves the sand and everything. You can't see it. If the footprint was in the grass, if the footprint was in the snow, I could follow that easy. Yes, God, I'm following you. Even though there's trouble, I can see it. But sometimes trouble is like an ocean. And God, I don't know where you are. I don't know where to go. If God's presence is hidden, what that means is that even though he's working, sometimes his working is also hidden whilst you're in the storm. What that means is that it looks like God is doing nothing. It looks like, God, why have you stopped working? Why are you not helping? Why am I not out of this yet? Joseph, in the book of Genesis, went through nine years of slavery and imprisonment, and it looked like God was doing nothing. But the Bible reveals in Psalms 105, 17, He sent a man before them. Joseph didn't see the workings of God because he was in the waters of trouble. But the Bible says God was with him the entire time. In the book of Esther, the plot comes against the Jews. And it looks like God had abandoned them. That He's not even mentioned in the entire book of Esther. Do you realize that? God isn't mentioned once in the book of Esther, which proves the point that in trouble... We don't really see where God is. But the Bible says, when suddenly we see uh, uh, God, when we, we suddenly see God when the answers come. But here's the revelation. God has always been working before you saw the answer. So where are you, God? What have you done? Oh, now you come. No, no, no. He's been there the entire time keeping you. In his timing, in his power, in his wisdom, God will make a way for you to get through your trouble. Verse 19, your path led through the sea, your way through the mighty waters, though your footprints were not seen. It's only after that we realize, you know what, wow, God, I'm sorry, I realize you were in control. See, what that means today is that you and I, when you're in the midst of trouble, you have a responsibility to rehearse the works of God from the past. This is why the psalmist trusted God and wrote the psalm, because he was in trouble. He couldn't see God, but what did he do? He said, God, I know what you've done before, therefore I know you're going to come through today. Psalms 5, uh, verse 5, 5 and 6. I have considered the days of old, the years of ancient times. I call to remembrance the song in the night. I meditate in my heart and my spirit makes diligent search. Uh, Verse 11 and 12. I remember the works of the Lord. Surely I will remember your wonders of old. I will meditate on your works. This is a common theme in the book of Psalms that they are looking back and remembering what God done so they can remember, God, you are still with me today. When you don't see God working for you today, when you don't see and feel God working next to you today, I want to encourage you and urge you to stir your faith from the past. 
Because if God has moved in the past, God will move for you today. God's help is transferable. If he's broken through in one area for you, but you say, God, you know what? You're faithful. You can do this. You can do this. You can help me today. See, a key component of the psalmist's breakthrough was that he spoke out loud the testimony of God. Verse 11, I will remember the works of the Lord. Surely I will remember your wonders from of old. One commentator says that this remembrance was actually a public remembrance. In other words, it was like a church service. It was a gathering together and let's together remember and speak about the wonders and the goodness of God. Christian, you need to speak faith in the midst of your trouble. You need to speak words of life around the conversations at your dinner table. When you're, when you're by yourself and those idle words and thoughts and you're murmuring. I mean, I don't know if you, you don't have to admit this actually because it makes you sound crazy. But uh, we all talk to ourselves, right? Uh, yeah, okay, you know, you're not going <laughs> to put myself in a catch-22 there. I told you not to admit it and then I asked you to help me. Um, but, okay, I talk to myself and I'm sure that some of you talk to yourself. And the, you know what? You're, you're talking to yourself down the road or you said something happened. And, oh, and, yeah, and you're talking to You need to speak faith when you talk to yourself. You need to stir your heart. When you're having conversation with friends, when you're going through troubles, speak faith and speak out the Word of God. In 2018, I read a story of friends who were hiking in the mountains. One of the friends, a young girl called Sarah, she slipped on a, 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 on a rock and she fell into one of the ravines. As they were climbing, she was unconscious and she was trapped down the ravine. The other friends didn't know what to do. They went to her aid, but they panicked. They had no idea what to do. One young man in their group, he yelled for help. He, rather than going down, down into the trouble, he yelled outwards to, the, to wherever he could, and there was thankfully some atten- he got the attention of some other experienced hikers who were nearby. They heard the cries for help, they came, they rescued uh, their friend Sarah, they called the emergency services, and she was safe. Here's the point for you speaking faith out loud, p- crying out in prayer to God, getting a hold of Him, and seeking Him. In the quiet place is what will save you from your trouble. So let me conclude and talk quickly about the blessing of leadership. Because the hopeful part of our scripture is that God also not only helps us in trouble and is with you in trouble, God has provided leadership to help you through the seasons of trouble. Actually, what the scripture says is God's God's gift to help Christians in trouble is leaders. Verse 10, you led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. The revelation is that we're not designed to fight our battles by ourselves. God has given us leaders for moments of trouble, for direction, so that we can have a a, a way to say, oh, let me listen to the wisdom or the direction that they would say. Ephesians 4 verse 11, He Himself gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the equipping, literally the building up of the work of the ministry of the saints for the edifying of the body of Christ. In Exodus 17, it's ironic that the people blamed Moses and their leadership, but it was Moses that was appointed by God to help them get through the troubles of that moment. Exodus 17 verse 11, Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed, and when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. Moses had a different perspective. He could speak into the life. He could speak into the moment. He could oversee and say, we're not going to do that. That's not a good idea. Let me help you because this will take you this way. Uh, uh, Actually, that's not normal that Moses on the mountain was able to influence a battle down there. What it reveals is that leadership and help in times of trouble is a supernatural help from God to help his people. I learned in the sermon writing sessions that, uh, th- this week that in the U.S. military, a soldier's rank is actually represented by his viewpoint. 
So if you have a, a, a lower ranking officer, his, uh, um, his emblem, if you like, his, his image on his uh, office jacket is a fence panel. It's a fence. If you have another ranking officer, it's a tree. Then it goes up and you have an eagle in the sky. If you are a general, you are represented by stars. In other words, they understand the higher up the leader, the bigger the viewpoint he has to see what's going on. That, that's a spiritual principle. Leadership is given by God to help you because they have a bigger viewpoint. Sometimes I call my pastor, uh, uh, can you help me? Da, da, da. What do you think about this? Uh, uh, you know what? I don't know if that's a, but maybe you shouldn't. And, uh, oh, thanks for that, pastor. I didn't see it that way, but he has a bigger viewpoint than me. See, leadership provides direction that will lead to blessing. 2 Samuel 5, 23, Therefore David inquired of the Lord and said, You shall not go up, circle around behind them, and come up behind from the mulberry tree. The Bible says David sought direction and that his direction blessed the people of God. I know direction isn't always easy. I know it's not always what we want to hear, but it's there by God to help us through the storms and that your life would be blessed after the direction. Leadership sometimes simply provides spiritual support, sometimes in trouble, sometimes in circumstances we don't have a solution. Sometimes, amen, the Bible doesn't give us a way that you do this and everything will be fine. But what we do know is it's reassurance and help and spiritual covering from the enemy. And this, why, this is why the devil wants to separate you from the house of God and from headship. Matthew 26, strike the shepherd and the sheep will flee. Those who are unrepentant or unwelcoming of leadership in their life become vulnerable to the enemy. You make mistakes that you don't need to make if you simply seek the higher perspective. Those who don't go to church become vulnerable to the enemy. You know what? I'm a Christian. I can be a Christian by myself. Well, Jesus died for the church the church is the bride of Christ, not individuals. We come into the house of God. We are protected and we are directed with spiritual covering. See, and I close today that this scripture describes a partnership that helps you make it through the storm. It is God. It is us trusting him when we don't see him and then seeking the covering of leadership. I want to encourage you today, you will get through the storms you're facing today. There are things that you say, I don't know how this is going to work out. I don't know what's going to happen here. God, why? I don't know all those answers. But what I do know is God is faithful to lead his people through the storms of our lives. Storms are circumstantial. That means they come to an end. But God is everlasting. If you trust him, he will lead you through temporary problems. In 2009, there was a battle in Afghanistan called the Battle of Kamdesh. And uh, what it was, was <coughs> um, troops um, from the west were uh, uh, at a combat outpost in Afghanistan. It was built in a valley. And they were surrounded by hills. And actually, it was quite a small outpost. One day, the Taliban decided that they were going to fight against this outpost and 300 Taliban fighters came to the outpost. They had mortars, they had grenades, they had snipers. And, and they say that the soldiers uh, 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 in the outpost were outnumbered 10 to 1. The Taliban, uh, as the story goes, uh, uh, made it into the outpost within 48 minutes. I mean, it did take no, almost no time for them to penetrate the defenses and they were coming to kill these men. As soon as they realized nothing could be done, they called for help just before they were defeated. They radioed in the stars. They radioed in uh, support. And within a few moments' time, Apache helicopters, airstrikes consisting of 19 fighter jets were organized, flew over the, 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 the trouble. And the soldiers on the ground said that moment turned the battle, and they were saved. You see, when you call upon God, when you involve headship in your life, 
It might not look like there's any hope. It might not look like there's any path through. But God is there with you in the battle, and God will deliver you as you call upon him. Why don't we have every head bowed, every eye closed there? We want to pray, and we want to believe God this evening for God's help for our lives and our circumstances. Before Christians pray tonight, I want to take some time this evening for those who are here, but you're not right with Jesus. You're not a Christian, or you don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior. You know, we do this in every single one of our church services because it's the most important decision a man or woman can ever make. The Bible says that we are all sinners and we've all fallen short of the glory of God. There are things tonight that you battle with. There are things tonight that you carry in your heart, uh, guilt and shame and, 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 and a heaviness over life, maybe depression or, or just all sorts of issues But the Bible says that they are rooted in sin. We've done wrong and one day we will face the consequences of our wrong because the judgment of God is perfect and righteous and all who have sinned, you will face the judgment of God one day. The reason why we're Christians and the reason why you're here today is because Jesus is alive and Jesus came to this earth, gave his life on a cross as a spiritual sin substitute, that whoever would believe on him would not perish, but you can have everlasting life. You can be forgiven of your sins. The burden in your hearts that you carry, you don't have to carry those anymore. But you can have a confidence that your sins are forgiven, that you can receive the love of God who gave everything for you. And if you're here tonight and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, or maybe you're a backslider, you once did know Christ, but today you're not living right, I want you to simply signify, you know what, preacher, I want to get right with God. I didn't get everything you said tonight, but I do get that I'm a sinner, and I don't want to face judgment without Jesus. I want to be right with God and be forgiven and repentant and find my true spiritual home that your soul can rest. If you want that tonight, I want you to signify with an uplifted hand that you want to pray and receive Jesus. You want to get right with God. You're backslidden or unsaved. God is knocking on your heart. You feel a pounding. That's the Spirit of God because He loves you, because He cares for you. You're actually in a room full of people who made that decision, and you say, man, I'm going to do that as well. I want Jesus. My, My life is a mess. I have no idea where I'm going, what I'm doing, but today that can all change if you would receive Christ. You're backslidden or unsaved. You want to lift up your hand. You want to receive Jesus. Anybody here? Amen. Amen. I see that hand at the back. Thank you for your honesty. Anybody else you want to join this honest heart? Amen. Don't worry about anybody else. You just lift your hand. You seek Jesus. God loves you. He loves you and gave everything for you. Amen. Amen. The lady that lifted her hand at the back, amen, would you look up at me? Amen. You, you meant that today. You want to receive Jesus? You want to receive Jesus, amen, as your Savior? Amen. Yeah, no, we can, we, can pray, we can pray right now. Would you come? Would you come to the, to the front? Uh, every head is bowed, every eye is closed. Uh, we're going to need a, a lady altar worker today. Amen. God bless you. Amen. Thank you. We're going to need a lady to help us pray. Amen. God bless you. Uh, for me, would you pray? Would you pray with us? Amen. Amen. God bless you. You take a seat or a knee. And uh, for me, going to pray with you. A sinner's prayer. God bless you. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Church, changing the call and talking to Christians. The psalmist today gives us wisdom that lasts for thousands of years because his trouble is exactly the same as ours. We don't know what it was, but we know it was trouble. It caused him to be overwhelmed. It caused him to doubt God to question his life himself, to question his headship, to question all sorts of things. God, are you even there? God, why is this happening to me? And we cry out in our distress, in our trouble. The good news today is the footprints of God remain even in the sea. Even when you can't see God working, I declare to you today, God is working 
that your life would be healed or blessed or changed from this trouble. Joseph, Esther, many different people in Scripture, God was working when they couldn't see Him. And I want to urge you today, amen, to put your faith back upon the trust and faithfulness of God. Lord, I don't see you right now, but I know what you've done. I know what you're capable of. I know your love for me. And God, I trust you until I find my deliverance, until I'm healed, until there's breakthrough, until there's change. I speak faith. I trust you. I look. Because you, as you trust him, you will eventually see his footprints that will lead to the deliverance you need. I talked tonight also about headship. Sometimes we distance ourselves. Sometimes we don't know what's going on. Sometimes we fear. Sometimes we don't want. I can do it by myself. I don't need to come to church. I'm fine. The Bible says, amen, it was through Moses that deliverance was found. Headship is a blessing of God to help us through our troubles. We all need it, but it requires humility. It requires, amen, a grace. God, I'm going to ask. I'm going to speak. I'm going to talk to you. I'm going to come under the covering of spiritual headship. Amen. God has spoken tonight. These altars are open. Why don't we come and find a place to pray? You can come to this altar and you can pray this evening. Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord. We give you glory. Oh, Jesus. Oh, God. Hallelujah. We thank you. God, we give you glory. We worship you. We magnify your name. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Oh, Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. I thank you. God, I give you glory for all that you're doing. God, have your way. God, bless us and be with us. We desperately need you, Jesus. God, we desperately need you, Lord God. We're asking for your deliverance and your hand over us. We're praying for the supernatural grace of God over this place. God, over our hearts, over our circumstances, we put our trust in you. Jesus, we need you, Lord God, and we pray for your hand. We pray, Lord God, for your healing and your help over us, Lord, in Jesus' mighty name. Oh, God, have your way. Oh, Jesus, have your way. I thank you. God, I give you glory and I magnify your name. God, you are awesome, God, and glorious. We praise you and I thank you. God, I'm asking for, God, that you would bring deliverance. I'm praying today, Lord God, you would bring breakthrough and help over our lives. God, we so desperately need you. God, we trust you, Lord God, and we believe you. We confess faith, God, in the name of Jesus today over our circumstance. You seek him tonight. You believe God this evening to be your deliverer. Trust him in direction. Seek him. Hallelujah, Lord. We give you praise. We give you glory. Oh, God, you are awesome. God, you are wonderful, Lord. We praise you. Sing it out this evening, amen. Lift up your hands. Let's worship Him. Let's put our faith and our trust in Him, His direction. Even if His works are hidden, we know He's working. God is the strength. God is the strength of my heart. God, You're the strength of my heart. God is the strength. 
from my heart and my portion forever. Forever. Let's give God praise together. Lord, we thank you. We give you glory and we need you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Have your way. In Jesus' mighty name, we praise you. God is your strength, your deliverer, amen. You trust him even when you don't see um, his footprints, amen. You trust that they are there and God is directing us. We're going to close in a word of prayer uh, as we do so. Issa, would you close in prayer for us as we go today?